in this clip I'm going to solve the questions of uh, exercise 5. The first question is about calculating normal probabilities. The important information here is that we know that we have a random variable, it's the number of days someone employed takes off sick in a year. Uh, so that is the random variable. Let's call it um, S for uh, sick days. Okay. And uh, we know that altogether there's working population of 30 million that will become important later. And we have a sample average, um, I shouldn't say um, x, but s bar. Uh, and um, that is equal to 13. And the sample standard deviation, oh, that is an s and a little s subscript, uh, is uh, 6. Okay, so that's uh, information we have here. So now the question is what's the probability that an individual will start with A? What's the probability that an individual will take between 7 and 19 days off? So the one extra important information that is in here is that this random variable is normally distributed. Okay, so uh, we have s being normally distributed with mean 13 and standard deviation 6, so the variance is 6 squared. Okay, so that's the important thing. That means we really have to think of that random variable s as a random variable that is normally distributed and it has a density that looks like this. Okay, so we'll treat it as a continuous random variable even though well, you can take perhaps half days off for a few hours if you if you go to the doctor. So we will treat it as a continuous random variable here. Yeah. So now the question is what is the probability that S will at A that S will be between seven and nineteen. Okay, so we're gonna do we'll always do this graphically as well and I'll just copy that uh, here. So I will just put it here. So between 7 and 19. So we know the average is at 13, so 7 is uh, somewhere here, and 19 is somewhere here. So graphically what we are after is this area here. Okay, so this is what we are, this is what we are after. We know we can read probabilities of the normal table. I have the normal, the normal table uh, here, and we're gonna we're gonna use that. Remember what type of probabilities are given in this normal table? It's probabilities of that type. Okay, that the standard normally distributed random variable is smaller than a certain value. So that means we really need to transfer this probability into we need to decompose it into probabilities that's only of the smaller type. Let me just use a different color. Well, let's look at the green one here. Okay, This area here, the size of that area, is the same as the probability that S is smaller than 19. Okay, So that's already the type of probability we can, we can use. Uh, but it's not the one we want. However, if we subtract this probability here, the red one, then we are left with exactly the red area. And the red one is, of course, the probability that S is smaller than 7. So now we need to, to calculate these probabilities. Remember, to get to the normal table, we need to, to be able to use the standard normal table we need to translate this s variable that is distributed with this mean and standard deviation, we need to translate it into a standard normal random variable. 
Okay, and that standard normal random variable is distributed like this, and for this we have a table. So the question is how do we translate this? Remember the translation formula is s minus the mean, that's s bar, divided by the standard deviation of s. There are lots of s's here. So that's basically going to be s minus 13 divided by 6. Now that s, what value we use, depends on what value we are interested in. So here, for instance, the 19. So to translate this, we have p 19 minus and then so we basically we are using this formula here minus 13 divided by 6 so this is now a standardized value and therefore we are not saying s anymore but we are using z because that's what we translated in so the green probability is that these two green elements are exactly the same so minus now the red bit and we do exactly the same so we'll standardize this value, 7 minus, so again we are using the same formula, 13 divided by 6. And again, instead of S, we now have Z. So now we need these probabilities. Let's go to the um, normal table. I did I actually close it. Okay, so ah, well, we're not quite there yet. We first need to make this a little bit simpler. So here we have p set smaller than that's 90 minus 13 is 6. 6 divided by 6, that's 1 minus the probability that set is smaller than, and here we have negative 1. So now we can, these probabilities are probabilities we can get from the uh, from the table so it's set equal to one let's see let's we need to find one it's here one point zero zero so we have the first column because we don't have it's zero the second after the second digit after the decimal point so here our value is 0.8413 so 0. 8413 that is the probability for that green probability the red probability we need to find set smaller than negative 1 so we need to find negative 1 here here we've got negative 1 again we got to use the first column because that's where we have zero so negative 1 0 1 0.1587 so that's 0.1587 and if we um, calculate that we have 0.8413 minus 0.1587 and we get about 68%, 68.26. So that is equal to 0.68.26. So that area here is 0.6826. So the probability that our that if we take one randomly drawn worker, that this worker takes off between seven and nineteen days is um, 0.6826. Alright, that was A. Let's continue on with B. So B, well after what's the probability that an individual will take less than 25 days off? So again, let us do this graphically as well. go. So what we are after is we'll have 13 here and 25 somewhere here where exactly you draw it doesn't matter that's just schematic and we're after this probability. 
in here. Now this is easy, this is already in the form in which we can read probabilities of the normal table. So now we just got to standardize this. So that's 25 minus 13 where we're still using exactly the same standardization formula here just with a different value for s. So 25 minus 13 divided by 6 and again we now have set that's the probability uh, 25 minus 12 divided by 6 that's 2 so set smaller than 2 let's go to the table we need to find set equal to 2 it's here and again it would be the first column because it's exactly 2 0.9772 so here we have 0.9772 so this is this probability 0.9772 what's the problem we'll take a, ah actually you see I read the question wrong it actually says we'll take at least 25 days off I here calculated probability that is, is smaller than 25 so that's at most uh, so what we really want, let me just use a different color, uh, it doesn't harm what we calculated, is the probability that S is at least 25. So at least means it could be 25 as well, but if, you know, if we treat something as a continuous random variable, the equal sign doesn't matter. Now this is the green bit here, okay, but to get this, this is not the type of probability we can read off the table. To get it, we really need to calculate 1, because you know the entire area is 1, minus the probability that s is smaller than 25. Now that is already the probability we calculated here, 0 0.9772. So what is in the, in the green bit? This is just 1 minus 0 0.9772. 772 and that is equal to 0 0.0228 okay so here we already know the probability is 0 0.0228 so probability that someone will take at least 25 days off is a little bit larger than 2% 2.28% Okay, C, what's the probability that an individual will take less than seven days off? So this is now the easy case. C, probability that S is less than seven. Okay, so this is now exactly already the type of probability which we can easily calculate. Actually, well, we don't need that. The, this simple example we can do without. We know this is used the standardization 7 minus 13 divided by 6 is said. Okay, so that is just the same as probability that said is smaller than negative 1 and actually we already calculate this probability it's up here okay so it's smaller than negative 1 because we had the value 7 here as well and we know that was 0 0.1587 so let's just give the answer straight away so that was pretty simple uh, how many people in the population will take off at least 19 days okay so Firstly, what we need for that is the probability that we take off at least 19 days. So let's see whether we can actually use some probability here. Firstly, we know again, we have to really translate that into this problem. Okay, such that we can get this guy from the table because that is smaller than something. Now, S smaller than 19, that sounds familiar. Yeah, indeed. We already calculated that up here. Remember, that was the green area. And we found that this probability was 0 0.8413. So, 1 minus 0 0.8413. That's 
So we know that the probability that an individual worker will take off at least 19 days is going to be 0.1587, almost 16%. But now the question asks, how many people in the population will take off at least 19 days? Now we need to know how big the population is, 30 million. So how many out of 30 million? How many out of 30 million question mark well we think there's a probability that of almost 16 percent so basically almost 16 percent out of 30 million so we calculate 30 million times 0.1587 so times 0.1587 so we think that this is about 4761 4761 million almost 5 million okay so we think that almost 5 million take off at least 19 days now of course I made up these numbers so uh, don't um, take these results too serious E how many people will take off at least 31 days so we need, we know we need S is larger or equal than 31. That means we need to calculate probability of smaller than 31 because then 1 minus that will give us the requested probability. This is again a simple problem. So, uh, sorry, yeah. so the standardization 31 minus 13 divided by 6 and once you standardize we get s 31 minus 13 that's 18 18 divided by 6 is 3 so we have 1 minus probability that said is smaller than 3 this we can get from the table we just need to find 3 down here it is and we have exactly 3 so 0.9987 so we know this is 1 minus 0 0.9987 and that's the same as 0 0.0013 and then how many out of 30 million well that's going to be 30 million times 0 0.0013 and uh, let's see what we get here Three twenty. Oh, no, that must have been a mistake. Uh, Thirty million times one point oh oh one three. Ah, here we go. Thirty nine thousand. Okay, so we expect thirty nine thousand employees to take off. Basically, at least a calendar month of sick days. So in working day, in working months, that would be more, perhaps one and a half. Okay, that was D. No, that was E. Now F. Think about the 10% of the population that take the least days off. These 10% take at most M days off. What is M? Okay, so this we're going to do graphically again. So we said we want the 10% that take the least off. So basically, graphically, we're interested in those 10% that take the least off. And then the question is, they take at most M days off. So what's the largest number of days off these 10% take? Well, it's exactly this value, this M value, right? Okay. So, and this we want, we want to find out what that is. So now we're basically going to be using the table in reverse. So remember, we were asking the probability 
So we know it has a probability that s is smaller than m, and that is 0.1. Okay. Usually we have this m, and then we calculate the probability. Now we have the probability, but we want to find the m. So we know, again, we, we standardize. Just that this time we don't have the value for m. Okay, so we know that z smaller than m, and now the standardization, minus 13 divided by 6. We know that this is equal to 0.1. So basically, what we now need to find is, from the normal table, we need to find which set value gives us a probability of 0.1. So let's find here. So now we have to look in the center of the table, and we'll see here, for instance, here is 1%, but we not want 0.1, so we want 10%. So here's 9%, we're pretty close. Uh, here is 10, 10, here we go. This is the closest we get to 10%. And the value here for Z is negative 1.28. Negative 1.28. So we know that we are here talking about negative 1.28. That is equal to 0.1. But now, how do we solve the problem? We want the m. Well, we just set these two guys here equal. Okay, so we say that these two things should be equal. So, what do we have? n minus 13 divided by 6 is equal to negative 1.28. Now, negative 1.28, so what we need to do is m minus 13 is, so we multiply both sides with 6, so that's negative 1.28 times 6, and then we need to add 13 on both sides, so m is equal to negative 1.28 times 6 plus 13 and what do we get here? 1.28. Um, sorry, that was not what I wanted. Um, 1.28 negative times 6. That is that. And now we need to add 13. What we get is 5.32. Okay, so that is equal to. 5.32. So now we know the m value. It is 5.32. Of the 10%, if you take the least days off, the maximum number of days they take off is 5.32. So this was an example where we used the table in reverse. Okay, we didn't have the m, but we did have the probability. Look at the previous uh, previous examples here, for instance, in C. Okay, we did have the m equivalent value, but we didn't have the value of the probability, and then we used the table to eventually get our probability value. So here, we had to use the table in reverse. So let's go back to G. The one percent of workers who take the most days off take at least how many days off? So this is in a way exactly the same type of problem, just on the, in the right tail of the distribution. So I'll put this here, so we have G now. G, so what we basically need is S smaller than M in the right tail, okay, 1% in the right tail, so we want this to be 0.01. Sorry, let me just take this away and we'll find um, and this is not quite correct. So we want that m value. Okay, so the 1% we want to know what is the minimum number of days they take off. 
So what we know is that 0.01, that is the probability for s being larger than m. Well, we know these we don't get from the table, so, but we know that the probability of s being smaller than m is going to be 99%. If that's 1%, that's got to be 99%. So really, we can translate that problem into this. Okay, you remember we can put an equal to here, it doesn't matter for continuous random variables. And now we have exactly the same problem as in part f. Okay, we have a small, let me take the equal away, just for consistency, it doesn't matter. This type of problem is exactly the same, just with a different probability. So that means what we now need to find in the table is this probability of 0.99, because we will then know what value of z is going to be 0.99. But then again, remember that we will basically standardize this. It's going to be z is equal to m minus 13 divided by 6. And then we will, once we have this value here, we will set it equal to this and then we can solve for m. So let's find this value, 99, I'll look in the table, where do we have 99, 99, or 1. This is the closest one and that is at 2.33. Okay, so this is our, our z value, 2.33. So now, now we set these two guys equal and we get 2.33 is equal to m minus 13 divided by 6. And so if we solve this for m, I'll just jump a couple of steps. All we're going to get is 2.33 times 6 plus 13. So that's Get again our calculator times 6 equal plus 13, get 26.98. So we get 26.98. This is now the M. Okay, that means of the 1% who take the most days off, the minimum number of days they take off is 26.98. So that was uh, part G of the question. So let's solve question 2 of exercise class 5. This is a hypothesis test question. Okay, So that's pretty clear in the question. It says test a null hypothesis. And here is the null hypothesis is that a grade is equal to something. So firstly, you need to know, yes, it's hypothesis testing. Let's see, look at the information. Uh, 35 students, okay, so here we have the information N, that's our sample size of second year BA, uh, members of the BAE Econ Society, told you what their grade in introductory stats was. And we have an average grade, so let's just write down what we know, N equals 35. Then we got an average grade of 57. So let's say um, x is the random variable uh, for grade in econ 10062, then x bar was 57, and the sample standard deviation, so s, was 15. So that's the information uh, we have. So now part a. We're asked to test a null hypothesis. I copied from our lecture slides our five steps, okay? So we, we remember what we need to do. So firstly, we need to set the null and the alternative hypothesis. We're being told here that the null hypothesis should be that the average grade is equal to 60. Now, the average grade, now it's important to understand that the average here that is not the same as the sample average. So the average, let's call that mu. We usually call it mu, you can call it whatever you want. Okay, so that average is mu and we are hypothesizing that that is equal 
to 60. Okay, we have a sample average of 57, but that sample average is not the same as the unknown population average. So that is the unknown population average. And the alternative hypothesis, well, if that's the null hypothesis, the alternative has to be the complement. The complement is that mu is unequal to 60. So here's our, these are our hypotheses. Step two, so step one. So we need to set a significance level. Here we are told to use alpha equal to 0 0.05. So that was step two, that was quick. Remember what that means. That is the probability we allow ourselves with which we allow ourselves to reject a correct null hypothesis. So, step three, devise the test statistic. We are testing on a population mean. You know, because I told you that to test such a hypothesis, we need a t-test. And you also remember the formula for that, or you need to remember, that is x bar sample mean minus mu, that will come from the population, divided by sample standard deviation, divided by square root n. Okay. Um, now we also need to know how this is distributed. So this is distributed normally. Okay. Uh, and standard normally. That means we get critical values from here. So we now want we now need a decision rule. Okay, that's part uh, decision rule. That's part of step three. So decision rule. Okay. So let us just sketch a normal distribution here. Okay. So that is set. And we know set, that is a standard normally distributed random variable. Okay, that is centered around zero. So let's see if our sample mean actually comes out at around 60, that delivers us no reason to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, because the sample mean turns out to be very close to what we hypothesized. And if that is the case, if x bar comes in close to 60, then we will have, we can already actually, let me write here, x bar minus 60, because we know the 60 from the null hypothesis. We're not calculating the test that yet. So if that x bar comes in around 60, that t-test will be close to zero. Now, what will constitute evidence against the null hypothesis? Well, either if we find x bars that are much smaller than 60 or much larger than 60. So as x bar gets smaller and smaller, what will happen to our t-test? Our t-test will become more and more negative. Okay, because if x bar goes smaller than 60, we get something negative, And the bigger the distance between x bar and mu, the smaller our set becomes. Okay, so we are basically moving into this direction away from the zero. If our another type of evidence against the null hypothesis is going to be very large x bars, if our x bar gets much larger than 60, we get very positive terms here, and our t test will become larger and larger. Okay, so we'll move into this direction. The question is now, at what stage, at what value for the t step are we actually going to reject the null hypothesis? What is significant evidence against the null hypothesis? And this is where our alpha comes in. We basically were saying we want to, at some stage, okay, we will say we've gone too far, okay. And if we, if we have a t test beyond these two margins, we will say reject h naught, okay. Or if it goes beyond here, we will also say reject h naught. In between, we will say do not reject h naught. So the question is now, how do we find these two, what we call critical values? And this is where the alpha comes in. We'll find them such that the area beyond the two critical values 
will add up to 5%. Okay? Now, since we are looking for critical values on both sides, how do we do that? Well, we'll make sure that each area has 2.5%. Okay? And then the area altogether will add up to 5%. So that means we now need to find a, these values, and we'll find them from the normal table, that cut off 2.5% in the tails of the distribution. So let's go to our table. Okay, so just it's a, little, a little smaller. So we want to find the value that cuts off 2.5% in the left tail. Well, we need to look for 2.5% here, 2.74, 2.5 here. Okay, now that set value is negative 1.96. So we know that this value here is negative 1.96. Now, what is that value going to be? Well, we could look it up again. We could look now for 0.975 in the table because we know everything up to that value, the area underneath the density function up to that value will be 97.5%. But we also know that the normal distribution is symmetric, therefore the value here is going to be 1.96. But let, just to make sure, let's go, I, I uh, deleted the table. Let's call it up again. Here it is. So just to make sure that this is uh, this works right, let's find 0 0.975, 975, and that is 1.9. And then if we go up, that column is the column six. Okay, it's 1.96. So that's all fine. So that means our decision rule is reject h naught if our t test is either smaller than negative 1.96 or larger than 1.96 okay so, now we can go to step 4, calculating the test statistic. So, our t-test is going to be our sample mean, that was 57, minus 60, divided by the standard deviation, that was 15, divided by square root of the sample size, sample size was 35. So let's uh, whip out the calculator. Let me first calculate the denominator. 35 square root is 5.9, then that's 1 over, multiplied with 15. So all we get is 2.53. 2.5355 up here we have 57 minus 60 so that is negative 3 so now we need to calculate negative 3 times uh, divided by our standard error so we'll just do this times 3 negative equals 1832 negative 1.1832 so where is our calculated test statistic it's somewhere here okay it's somewhere here it's in the do not reject region and therefore we can now go to our last step the conclusion will say do not reject H naught as negative 1.18 is not smaller than negative 1.96 and it's clearly not larger than 1.96 either. 
So that means that is no reason for us not to believe that the average grade could indeed be 60. The average grade in uh, statistics could indeed be 60. Okay, so that was part A. Let's go to part B. Um, just copy that down here. Test the hypothesis that the average grade was smaller than 64. Use an alpha of 1% this time. So let's go through our steps. Let's see where we can remember them without, well, I do, um, without looking at it. First, we need to set the null and the alternative hypothesis. So this is now a little bit of a tricky step. You see, the average grade was smaller than 0.64. So what we are, what this statement is saying in math mathematical terms is this one, mu smaller than 64. Now I told you in the lecture that the null hypothesis will always contain an equal sign. Now there's no equal sign here, so that means the only way you can test this is by putting this in the alternative hypothesis and then in the null hypothesis we have the complement and that is that mu is larger or equal to 64. Now we can we can also look at this in, in, in a different way. You want to establish that the average grade is smaller than 64 so you want to find average evidence that establishes that. You know that if you want to sort of prove something in inverted commas, remember we can never prove, we are always making statements with uncertainty here, but in inverted commas if you want to prove something, if you want to find evidence for something, you have to put that into the alternative hypothesis, because the null hypothesis is the default hypothesis. If the evidence isn't very good, we'll just stick to the null hypothesis. That is not, if you want to show that something is the, the case, sticking it into the null hypothesis is not going to work well. You have to stick it into the alternative and then show that we reject the complement. So I hope that made a little bit sense. So now we need to set an alpha. Here we are told to set it to 0 0.01. Uh, we also need to devise the test statistic. Again, we are testing for the mean, so we use exactly the same uh, test statistic. A means will yeah, okay, exactly the same test statistic, but now we have a different mu because now our mu, the mu of the test statistic always comes from the null hypothesis. Okay, so now our mu here is going to be 64, whereas uh, above our null hypothesis said that mu was 60, so that led to us using 60 here in the test statistic. So we have, that is going to be x bar minus 64 is this, and we know that this is standard normally distributed. Again, we need a decision rule. And we're going to draw a little sketch again. It's always easiest to do this with a little sketch. So here we have our set. We know that's centered around zero. Now what is going to be evidence that will lead us to reject the null hypothesis okay, in favor of the alternative? So we will reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative if our actual sample mean is much smaller than 64. Okay, that's the only sort of evidence that will make us conclude the alternative hypothesis is appropriate. If we had a sample average of 70, you know, we would not uh, abandon the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. So only evidence that this sample evidence was smaller than 64 and significantly smaller than 64. If x bar becomes smaller than 64, then we will see, we can see that from, from here, from the t-test, the t-test will become negative. So then we are moving into this direction. 
But that's the only direction for which we will consider rejecting the null hypothesis. So we need some sort of critical value. The question is, where should that be? Now we're using our alpha again. We want the critical, choose the critical value such that this area is 1%. Okay, and now we only look at one side because we have what we call a one-sided test. Part A was what we call a two-sided or two-tailed test. Okay, so we need that value set that cuts off one percent. Let's go to our normal table. So we want 0.01. We need to search for 0.01 in the table. And you can see here. We have 0.012 and 0.09, so this is the closest, 0.0099 is the closest, and we get that at the value of negative 2.33. Okay, so our critical value is going to be negative 2.33, and only if we are to the left of this value we will reject H0, if we are to the right we will not reject H0. So, decision rule, reject. That's always important that you write down the decision rule. Reject H0 if t-test is smaller than negative 2.33. So now we can come to the calculation. So our t-test is going to be the following. Our actual sample average, x bar is 57, minus 64, divided by, what was it, 15, divided by square root n, n is 35. We're using exactly the same information. Let's get our um, calculator back. First we'll have 35 square root, that's 1 over times 15, so we have divided by 2.5355, five, five. so exactly the same value as before, what is different now is this top value, 57 minus uh, 64, that is negative 7, okay? So we need 1 over that times 7 negative equals negative 2.7608 is negative 2.7608. So this value here, where does that come in? That comes in somewhere over here. Okay. So it is in the reject H0 reason, uh, region, therefore reject H0 as t-test is smaller than negative 2.33. Okay, so that means we, our null hypothesis was that the uh, average grade in the population of all introductory stat students was large or equal to 64, but we, del we delivered enough evidence to say that is not correct, we reject this null hypothesis and the average grade was actually smaller than 64. Okay, that was uh, question two.